the Prime Minister's personal ethics advisor. The second one he's lost, uh, resigned. He hasn't told us exactly why, although he's clearly had concerns over ethics and Partygate and the Prime Minister breaching the ministerial code on that. Um, do you think this is significant? Is it damaging for the Prime Minister? I don't think it is really. And I think actually lots of people are bored of Partygate now. I understand the anger. I understand the anger people felt when uh, Downing Street were having parties while the rest of us were making sacrifices. But it has dragged on a bit. And I think some people are obviously using it to try and damage Boris and obviously to damage Brexit. Yeah, they hated him anyway. They hate the Tories. They hate Brexit. Anything to go with. So I think people want to move on now, and I think his resignation won't make much difference to ordinary voters. And in terms of the Rwanda policy, obviously the front pages the Prime Minister would have been hoping for were all about Rwanda. I mean, one of them, Daily Mail, a uh, rab threat to ignore Euro court rulings. I mean, that's the sort of headline they desperately want instead of about the ethics advisor resigning. And what do you make of the European Court of Human Rights blocking uh, those Rwanda flights, well, that Rwanda flight on Monday night? I think it's a complete and utter disgrace. I think we're seeing the emergence of a new anti-democratic alliance with clergy, monarchy and unelected judges in Strasbourg who are trying to frustrate a government policy drawn up by a government that was voted into power by 14 million people. I think it is incredibly anti-democratic. Now, you don't, you can agree or disagree with the Rwanda policy. I have numerous issues with the Rwanda policy. I don't think it's going to work and I don't think it's particularly fair. But This is about democracy. Who rules this country? Is it the people we put into power or is it unelected people who think their moral feelings are superior to our votes? That's the question now. I mean, hear, hear to all of that. I mean, I, 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 can, I, can, I can let you hear people cheering you on about that. That is a big issue, isn't it? Um, let me get to the subject of which I actually invited you on, just ruthlessly getting your opinion, your top and worth on everything. Um, the best-selling US author, James Patterson, I mean, genuinely one of the best-selling authors in the world, uh, he has apologised. I was going to say a forced to apologise. We don't know if he was forced to or not, but I suspect he may have been. He's apologised for saying that white male writers have trouble finding work, and it's a form of racism. The 75 year old used social media to post an apology after comments appeared in the Sunday Times uh, where um, he uh, had expressed concern that it is uh, hard for white men to find writing jobs in publishing, film, TV and theatre. He said, it's just another form of racism. Can you get a job? Yes. It's hard. Is it harder? Yes. It's even harder for older writers. You don't meet any, uh, you don't meet many 52 year old white males. Criticism, obviously. Backlash, obviously. He's now posted an apology saying, I apologise for saying white male writers having trouble finding work as a form of racism. I absolutely do not believe that racism is practised against white writers. Because Please know that I strongly support a diversity of voices being heard. Um, do you think he was forced to do this? Yet another threat of cancellation, bringing another person to recant their views? I think so. And, you know, the most disappointing thing about that was the apology. You know, the fact that people are so unwilling these days to stand by their comments. He obviously does think there's a problem. That's why he said it to the Sunday Times. But then he felt obliged to retract and obliged to apologise because of the pressure that we live under in terms of the cancel culture. My view, I mean, I wouldn't call it racism. I think it's a bit different to racism. But there is definitely, as part of identity politics, there is an anti-whiteness. Whiteness, being white now means basically being lame. You know, oh, you're so white. And uh, older white men are referred to as pale, male and stale. And they are seen as a problem. In fact, they are seen as the cause of most of the problems in the world. So there is this kind of anti-white ideology, which I find quite weird and disconcerting. Yeah. Well, so we, have, we had Lenny Henry the other day, we discussed it on the show yesterday, saying he thought it was interesting um, and, and worth talking about that the, or not just that we talk about the acts, like, you know, Stormzy, you know, the, the first black headline, solo black headline, because he wasn't the first black headliner act, it's gone Nancy years ago, at Glastonbury some years ago, but that the audience was so white. I mean, yeah, I, do you remember Jon Snow commenting mm. on uh, on the you know the Brexit events and how how white these crowds were? And it's always said in a way it's like this is a problem. But you know we don't have enough Black and Asian people going hiking in the Lake District for some reason. It's the countryside is too white. If you said if I went to anything and said there are too many Black people here. Mm. There are too many white people. Or things. That would, you know, that would be. I mean, it would be an blatantly outrageous racist thing. It's totally relevant what colour someone's skin is when they're doing any of these activities. But it's become normalised now that you can talk about that. I think what James Patterson said was quite right. There, actually, there. I mean, white white men have had a very good deal for a long time, but we don't make the world a better place by basically saying, "Sorry, you're a white straight man. Sorry, mate, you can't you can't have a job now." 
That's right. And the way I see, you know, when identitarians go on about the problem of whiteness, I always think replace the word white with black and then see how it works. And then you recognize just how prejudiced they are being. And, you know, the irony with Jon Snow, of course, is that he made his comment about so many white people at a Brexit march. And then he was in Glastonbury singing, <laughs> apparently saying F the Tories to an audience yeah. that was predominantly I, white. I think I spent a week after he posted that comment, uh, posting yeah. pictures of Jon Snow at incredibly white events, literary festivals, Remainer marches. And things. I mean, goodness me, in a country that's 90% white it is highly likely a lot of the time that most of the people somewhere will be white that's right and and that's the point that people misunderstand but i think what's happened in the identity politics hierarchy whiteness is the worst thing you can be white and man the, i mean brendan i mean frankly man, yeah. i'm surprised we even let you on the show <laughs> but it's like um you know it's whiteness has become the original sin if you're born white then you were born with privilege you were born with all these terrible crimes of history on your shoulder you have to uh, appease for your uh, make amends for your privilege whip yourself on the back check your privilege yep. you have to live in a state of penance basically yeah, and exactly. that's a really ugly uh, and i think what's really interesting is when a 75 year old very successful writer who millions in the bank still feels under pressure to say i didn't mean what i said the idea that that man says things he doesn't mean is absurd feeling the need to recant repent apologize publicly so he doesn't get cancelled that tells you there is something very 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 strange going on brendan it's always a pleasure to talk to you brendan o'neill uh, chief political writer at spiked uh, 8 41 is the time this is talk breakfast